artwork is really nice. The poster and stuff. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think they've done a. I, Adeline in the eras, I thought was a really clever idea. I mean, you know, it's, it's so hard to do original artwork or to get mm -hmm. marketing departments to do original <laughs> art these days, and so they did a really nice job. Yeah. But great. Well, the, one of the more interesting things about the movie is that young Harrison Ford voice. What was the process for perfecting that? That just seems that seems like the most magical thing in the movie, almost. It's funny. <laughs> I mean, we we screened the film the other night at USC, and mm. one of the questions was, "Why did you decide to do face replacement for young Harrison Ford?" <laughs> Seriously, I said, "You just made my night. This is fantastic." Um, I mean, listen, we got lucky because mm -hmm. I found Anthony and Gruber, who plays young sure. Harrison, online um, doing impersonations. And he was an actor who did impersonations, but he also happened to be the biggest, I, I kid mm. you not, the biggest Harrison Ford fan on the planet. <laughs> he, he had been Indiana Jones for Halloween every year from the, his sixth birthday on. And, um, and, and not only does he s sound like him, he looks a lot like him. He does. And, he, and he's able to impersonate him. And on top of that, he's been acting for the last five years. So you're telling me years. there are no ADR tricks, nothing? I, oh my. Hand over my heart, not a single one. It's <laughs> truly all him the entire time. It's, That's it's crazy. crazy. That yeah. is crazy. The omniscient narrator thing, that's mm -hmm. such an interesting device. And I think it really adds to the film. Was that always okay. in the script? Was that? It was always there. And it's mm -hmm. definitely something, I mean, look, you talk to you know the Robert McKee fans of the world, and the narration yeah, is, a, is a lazy sort of <laughs> storytelling crutch. but. Listen, I'm I've been a fan of narration. I always have been. If it's if it's adding something to the story, not telling your story mm -hmm. for you, and you know, I look at films like you know, The Royal Tenenbaums is a great example. Sure. Um, uh, even as recent as the assassination of Jesse James, I thought that yeah. narration was great. And you know, I think for us, it was nice to have this sort of godlike perspective to add a bit of the magic to the story. It almost had something sort of clinical to it, something distancing to a certain extent. It's funny, the very first page describes the VO as somewhat clinical. Okay. And we like that because it's this very sort of, um, you know, straight ahead approach mm -hmm. to what is otherwise um, magical. And I think for, for me that gave it a kind of a grounded feeling, you sure. know what I mean? That it wasn't, there wasn't, there was just enough pixie dust, but not too much, you know what Does I mean? Does that counteract sort of, I, there's always that tipping point to going into schmaltz or something of sort course. of too sentimental, but yeah. I feel like this movie sort of walks that line very well. Does that sort of help there? Absolutely, I mean, you said it perfectly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was something that for me as someone who doesn't like schmaltz at yeah. all, I really <laughs> wanted to walk a line where, uh, like you said, it did stay somewhat clinical and that the, the VO had a, um, you know, a, a grounded quality to it. So um, I'm glad you feel like we walked the line well because it was something we, we worked very hard in all through production and and uh, and post. I mean, you didn't write this movie, but no. you did write Vicious Kind. I did. Um, so what is the process coming on to a script that you haven't written? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, first you've really got to sit down with the writer and walk through every mm -hmm. single word because you're going to get actors who are going to want to pick apart every little thing and I sure. want to have answers for all those questions. And so as a writer, you get to kind of skip that process and it, it almost allows you to be a little bit lazier, if that makes any <laughs> sense. But but r directing something that you haven't written, as I've done with my last two films, yeah. really requires you to have just the, the sort of, as, as Martin Scorsese says, he says, you have to love the movie more than everyone else working on it. Sure. And I would add to that by saying you have to know the movie better than everyone else working on it. And I think part of that is, is knowing the script and being able to, you know, not only speak to your department heads, but but maybe even more importantly, your actors and, and being able to be the best sounding board you can for them performance wise. And that's, you know, starts with really knowing the material. Do you add your particular sensibility to the script once you get it? I, I like to, I mean, uh -huh. in, in sort of the perfect world scenarios, I'm able to do that. I mean, I think in the case of Adeline, the script was in such great shape. They'd been working on it many, sure, many years. I, yeah. And so um, it was in great shape. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's a, a little bit of sort of protecting the the meat and potatoes of the script, and then allowing people like Blake and Harrison and McKeel and Ellen, who all are brilliant and have done this a long time, uh, let them come to it with their great ideas and and remain open to it, but be sort of the you know the arbiter of what mm -hmm. gets in and what doesn't. I know you uh, were mentored by Neil Butte. Yeah. Um, how does that sensibility? Because he does sort of much sort of darker Absolutely. sort of romance. You know, it's funny. I mean. My taste tends to skew that way. Okay, I mean, yeah. if you watch The Vicious Time, kind of, that's, that's sort of, you know, that's that's as personal a movie as I can make. I wrote it, I directed it, mm -hmm. I produced it, etc. cetera. Um, Adeline's a little bit different. I mean, Adeline, for me, was exciting because I thought I could take what was a, 
a, a really big high concept movie and and hopefully deliver a, a personal touch to it sure. and um you know i just i love the idea of seeing the beauty and growing old and i hadn't seen that before and i think trying to tackle that in a way like you said that's not schmaltzy but is actually um uh, touching and feels honest and real is was was a exciting if not daunting task but um, that was at least the the fingerprint I tried to put on it if I you know if that makes any sense editorially mm -hmm. what was the what was the first cut for the film how long lengthwise. Was it lengthwise funny enough it wasn't as long as a lot of first assemblies okay. are part of that is I photoboarded the whole movie I mean I really oh. shoot to, to, you know I, I'm trying to edit in camera as much as I can mm -hmm. um, uh, you know the Coen brothers are probably the best yeah. example of that but um, the, the first assembly was only like 2.15, 2 hours, okay. 15 minutes. Which, like, what, an hour 45? Yeah, yeah. so, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not one of those sort of like four-hour first assemblies sure. that you hear about a lot. And, you know, I still watch it and go, you know, maybe we could nip a couple of frames off that one shot. You're st I'm still <laughs> cutting it a little bit, even though it's too late. What did get cut finally? In terms of just, just uh, story there was wise. a couple of scenes. Where, where there was a scene where um, there's a gas leak in Adeline's apartment. This will be on the DVD, mm -hmm. so I think okay. I can speak to it. Yeah. There was a gas leak in Adeline's apartment, and the cops and and fire department show up and see fake IDs and whatnot on the table, and and her life gets sort of additional scrutiny. And I love the scene. <laughs> I really did. I, I love the way it was shot. David Lansbury, my cinematographer, lit it beautifully. I thought the performances were were really strong, but it's one of those where. Again, you have to be prepared to cut some of your favorite scenes because in at a certain point, the movie will dictate what should and shouldn't be in the film. And it was just one of those scenes where as much as I liked it, it was it was interrupting the flow of the love story between Whit Blake and McKeel, which was paramount to this sort of B story of her life on the run. And so we ended up losing that, um, in addition to a couple other small ones, but that was the big one. Great, well, thank you so much. Thanks, Lance. Tommy, appreciate it.